Hello everyone, it is Caitlin and today I'm going to teach you how to gauge a 19th century skirt. Okay, so what is gauging? Gauging is just simply one way on how to get all that fabric in a skirt compressed to a waistband. It is seen throughout the time period that I study, which is 1830 to 1870, with varying popularity throughout that time period. Today, gauging is more commonly known as cartridge pleating, so you may be more familiar with that term. Technically speaking, gauging is very similar to gathering and is done in basically the same way. It, however, cannot be done by machine. It has to be done by hand, simply because of the way the pleats will end up working. Machines cannot replicate that. It is somewhat time consuming, however there is like little to no math involved, which is kind of a plus. As far as popularity, you're going to need to look at the exact time period you're looking to replicate a dress, and also the fiber with which you're replicating a gown is going to play into that as well. My personal research with Branched is not as thorough as I would like it to be, and honestly I never took super detailed notes on waist treatment as I should have while looking at originals, so I don't have great percentages. So I did some very brief research, which is not as thorough as it needs to be, so don't take these as the end-all be-all, but I took literally the first 20 dresses for a fiber for a decade. So there's like, so I did 20 cotton dresses from the 1830s, and then, and then 20 cotton dresses from the 1840s, and then the 1850s, and then the 1860s, and I did the same for wool and silk. So our sample size is only 20 dresses, which in the grand scheme of things is not very big, but it is going to help us somewhat decide on whether gauging is appropriate for a fiber. Um, within a particular time period or not. But again, you're going to need to go a little bit deeper because from 1830 to 1839, that's a big range and things are going to fall in and out of fashion. And so if you're making a dress in 1830, it'll be different than a dress made in 1839. So you're just going to need to look at a little bit closer. But here are some general percentages that I kind of came up with. In addition from not narrowing down the year any further than a decade and only having a sample size of 20, there were some other things I did not take into account. One was the country of manufacture and where. Sometimes European fashions will differ from American fashions, and I just literally pulled the first 20 dresses I saw. Um, I didn't go into further research onto this. I didn't really go into age of wear, um, style of the bodice, style of the sleeves, level of fashionableness, that sort of thing. I just literally picked the first 20 1830s cotton dresses that I had listed in my database that I keep up. I did, however, limit it to dresses, so like, you know, riding habits, bathing costumes, that sort of thing. And I did pick adults dresses, not necessarily children's wear. But with all that being said, here's what I came up with. Out of 20 1830s cotton dresses, 18 were gauged and 2 were pleated. Out of 20 1830s wool dresses, 10 were pleated and 10 were gauged. Although, at least one of the pleated ones were mostly pleated, but there's a little section of gauging in the back. And I don't know how many of the others were like that because I didn't have pictures of the back. Out of 20 1830s silk dresses, 7 were gauged and 13 were pleated. For the 1840s, 19 out of the 20 cotton dresses were gauged and 1 was pleated. Also for wool 1840s dresses, 19 of the 20 were gauged and 1 was pleated. And for 1840s silk dresses, out of the 20, 17 were gauged and 3 were pleated. Now for the 1850s, out of the 20 1850s cotton dresses, all 20 were gauged. Out of 1850s wool dresses, 13 were gauged and 7 pleated. And out of 1850s silk dresses, 9 were gauged and 11 pleated. Now for the 1860s, I only took dresses 1860 to 1865. I didn't go past that. But for the cotton dresses, 19 were gauged and 1 pleated. For wool dresses, 1860 to 1865, Three were gauged, although two of those were sheer dresses, which do have different rules. And 17 were pleated. For 1860s silk dresses, out of the 20, two were gauged and 18 pleated, although at least some of those had pleating in the front and some gauging in the back. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Let's kind of generalize that a little bit. Gauging was popular in the 1830s, but not so much for wool and silk as it was for cotton. In the 1840s, it seems like almost everything was gauged, so gauging seems to be very popular for the 1840s, regardless of fiber content. Beginning of the 1850s, there seems to be a little bit more gauging, but by the end you see a lot of pleating across the fibers, at least silk and wool, although cotton is frequently gauged throughout this entire time frame. And also, sheer dresses tend to be gauged more often than pleated. So with all that being said, take that for what you will. Again, it's not the end-all be-all. 
you need to look at your specific time frame. You need to kind of go to your area where you're going to be doing living history and kind of and looking at what they would have done. Or at least if you don't have anything specific for your town or your county, something as close as you can get state, area, something to kind of see what they were doing and kind of narrow down a little bit of a year because there's a, again, there's a big difference between 1851 and 1859 dresses. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started by looking at an original dress that is gauged. So this is the original 1850 still dress that is gauged. You can see the skirt is directly attached to a waistband. And there's our gauging. Um, so the gauging threads, on this one there are two gauging threads. You'll see them too. I've seen three before on originals. Um, haven't seen more than three, but that's not necessarily impossible. Um, but you do want at least two. So the gauging threads were actually left in, which is very typical of gauge dresses. Uh, it's hard to tell from the front because the, the gauging threads are inside the pleats, but when you turn it to the back, you can see, at least on this side, where the gauging threads are. There's one here, and there's a set here. <laughs> Move that out of the way. So yes, right here and right here, they're about a quarter of an inch from the top. So they start from a quarter inch to the top, and they're about a quarter inch apart. Um, you notice that the skirt was turned under. So here's the edge of the skirt, the raw edge and she folded it under. This is called balancing the skirts, which is going to have to be a whole nother video, but essentially, because generally with a hoop or even with petticoats, parts of your skirt are gonna to need to be longer than other parts. So generally, you need more in the back than you do in the front. So you fold this over so you're not actually gauging on the raw edge, and you usually fold it over more in the front than you do in the back. So it's actually not attached at all. She just folded under, pressed it, and then she did her gauging threads, and that's what's keeping this folded down. But when we look at this particular dress, it is interesting because it is atypical for a gauge skirt. She just took her waistband and she whipped it on. Not every pleat. So generally, you see every individual pleat being whipped solely to the waistband. And you don't see it whipped to this top part. You see it whipped to the piping edge. So this is very atypical. You don't usually see this. I don't know why she did this. It's possible that she wasn't a very talented seamstress and she didn't know how to attach this very well. It's possible that she chose to do it because this is the way she does it and she's lazy, which um, I can appreciate. But generally, this way doesn't work very well. Uh, this works for this particular gown because this silk right here is super, super light. It is actually a um, tissue taffa. It is extremely light. This whole dress lays, I think, less than half a pound. It, I haven't actually weighed it, but it's, it weighs like nothing. It's like, it's like tissue paper. And so she was able to do this not very securely to keep that on. Whereas if you're dealing with any type of cotton, any wool, or really normal silk, you can't do this very well because it's going to weigh it down and it's going to pull it on, on it, you know, strangely. So this is not the secure way of ta attaching it. We're going to look at a few originals that have secured stitching, but this is the way that my original gauge dress is attached. It's just, again, atypical. So here's another original dress that is gauged. It's a silk dress, and you can clearly see how each individual pleat is whipped to the waistband because she used a color thread that is not matching. This way is a very sturdy, secure way of attaching gauging, and is a method you most often see in originals. This is another silk dress, this time dating to around 1864, and it's from the Kent State University Museum. It is mostly pleated, but has a small section of gauging in the back where every pleat is individually whipped. This dress appears to use a strip of polished cotton to stabilize and bulk up the silk. And here is an 1840s silk dress sold on eBay. Again, you can see each and every individual pleat is attached. Again, very secure way of attaching your gauging, and it's the one you see most often. And this is an 1850s printed wool dress from the Kent State University Museum. It is not as nicely sewn as some of the others, but when you, when you look closely, you can see at least every other pleat stitched down, and some places are showing definitely every pleat whipped to the waistband. It's just not a great picture. It's kind of hard to tell exactly what's going on. So now that we have looked at a few originals, let's get on to the how-to part of the video. So the video for this is actually already filmed, edited, and uploaded to YouTube, but I just got this original in the mail, and I wanted to show it to you because it had gauging. So actually the unboxing video that I unboxed this this skirt and about three bodices uh, will be coming out this Wednesday, so there'll be an extra video this week. But as kind of a sneak peek, here is the skirt. This is an elliptical time period, like 18, mid-1860s, late 1860s, and it is mostly pleated around the waist. Mostly pleated, so there's pleats. 
And then in the very back, she has gauging. Personally, this is my favorite waist treatment simply because I can have the look of pleats and not have to get my math perfect because I'll just take up whatever the little bit left over is in gauging. You do see this throughout the time period of 1830 to 1865, so it's a valid option. We see her little pleating, her little gauging here. It's kind of falling apart here, but there's her gauging. And you can see how her skirt is balanced. Um, we talked about that briefly on the other original where she had the edge folded. Um, and you can see with the plaid how easy it is to tell that it is um, balanced. Because look at her plaid. You can see this line here, but look how this line goes down. That's because she turned over more in the front than less in the back, which is what you need usually to get a longer skirt in the back if you have a bustle or anything like that going on, where you just need a little bit more just to make your hem even all the way around. So this particular gown, you can see her gauging threads when we look in here. She chose a dark green thread, so it does not match her fabric at all. <laughs> very, very dark, but still the same color technically. And we look on the inside, we'll go on this side. You can see each and every individual pleat is whipped to the waistband very finely. And of course she used the same thread all the way around the waistband. So she gauged this directly to a self-fabric waistband. There are a couple different ways to attach gauging to um, a bodice edge. One is of course a waistband, whether that waistband is attached to the bodice or not. Sometimes those waistbands are piped, sometimes they are not. So she just took a uh, piece of their silk and a piece of um, her lining fabric. She turned the raw edges under, whipped them all the way around this way, and then on the bottom she turned them under again about an eighth of an inch because this is where the um, line ends. And she just um, treated it as a piped edge. She just whipped each pleat individually to the waistband edge. You can also do this to a piped edge, which is what I'm going to show you today, but this is an option as well if you have a skirt that you're um, going to use more than one bodice with. So a lot of my silk dresses, I have an evening bodice and a day bodice. I'll put the skirt on a silk fabric waistband, so that way I can just um, sort of baste the whichever bodice I'm wearing at the particular time into um, this little ditch right here. So that is something that's totally doable as well. I'm going to show you how to do it to a piped edge, but essentially it's exactly the same thing. You'll just do it to the edge of your waistband if you're doing it by a waistband. So there are other, there are different ways, and there's also times you'll see a dress that is um, gauged around or pleated around whatever waist treatment you do, and instead of a waistband, they'll do it mostly to the bodice edge, but at the very front, they'll make a faux waistband, so it's just a tiny little bit of waistband. So I'll kind of show you an example of that too, even though I already had that dress done, I'll just kind of show you what that kind of looks like. So basically the three waist treatment, the three waist treatments you'll do are usually waistband to directly to a bodice edge or a uh, mostly to a bodice edge and then a little bit to a waistband. So I'll show you all three today, but I did want to quickly show you this original and look out for that video on Wednesday where we unbox this lovely. And now that we have seen some originals, we are ready to put this into practice. So I have here the um, waist edge of an 1830s silk skirt. So my skirt has already been balanced, so there is no raw edge. We're not going to gauge on a raw edge. This is my center back seam. So for this particular gown, I am knife pleating most of it, but I'm going to gauge the center back. So I'm going to show you how I gauge just on the center back section. So that's why I only have a little section here. Now if you're gauging an entire skirt, what you're wanting what you're going to want to do is to fold your skirt into fourths and mark the fourths off. So you only want to work with a little bit at a time. That way, if your gauging thread breaks, you don't have to redo the entire thing. You're only going to have to redo a quarter of it. And we're going to do at least two gauging threads. Two is what I've seen most often. I think I've also seen three on original um, as far as like um, gauging threads. But um, I'm going to do two today because why do, why do more than I have to? So what I'm going to start doing is I have my thread here, and I know you can't see it because it's brown, but it's there, I promise, and there's my needle. And um, gauging something you're going to have to do by hand. We cannot do it by machine, it just won't work right. So we are going to make basically little pleats with, um, with a gathering type thread. So I've seen most of the original start about a quarter inch from the very edge, and I'm going to start mine right where this pin is. 
because that's where the edge of my last pleat is. And so this is going to have to be something you're going to have to learn how to do for yourself because it's going to be different for you. How big your stitches are is going to be different for everybody. If you have a narrower skirt and a wider waist, you're going to have to take smaller bites. But if you have a really huge skirt, say like 170 inches that goes over a hoop skirt, and you have, say, a 25-inch waist, you're going to have to take really big bites of your fabric to get all that compressed into your waistline. So for me, this is about what I need right here. And you can see already it's kind of on my needle creating little pleats. So that's what gauging looks like. Just right there. I'm going to pull my needle through. Maybe. Got caught in something. Now if you have an especially small waist, what you're going to want to do is take really long bites on the front and small bites on the back. Just like that. If you have an exceptionally small waist. And that's going to make the pleats a little wider, but um, it's going to get more of that fabric compressed into a small waist. But you do want your stitches fairly even because you want your pleats to be fairly the same size. If you're working with a plaid or a check, it's going to be a lot easier for you to start out with and that's what I would suggest starting out with because you can use the pattern as a guide for how big your stitches need to be. My pin's here to hold everything in place. But we're just going to keep going until we reach the end or if you're doing it, when you reach your quarter mark. There's one thread right there. So that's now holding everything in place. We're going to do a second one now. So for our second row, we're going to start about a quarter of an inch, three-eighths of an inch, from the first row. And you want to make them exactly the same size and go in and out in the same places as you did the last row, at least as close as you can get. It's not the end of the world if you don't get it right, but... You do want to go very, very close because you want these pleats to be fairly even and not to be all wrinkled. And we'll get to the end. Make sure I need to go through. So now we have our gauging threads for this side. And if this was just your quarter, you'd have to go do that three more times. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take our gathering threads and pleat up all those lovely little pleats and have gauging. But I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of my skirt and then we'll do this part all at the same time. Alright, so now that our gauging threads are put in, there are the gauging threads, we are ready to attach it to a waistband. So there's the end of my waistband. Again, this one I pleated most of it and we're just gauging the last little bit. So I already went ahead and attached all my pleats with little whip stitches and now we're ready to do the gauging. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull on my two threads, pull them at the same time so the pleats stay even. And we're going to get a pin real quick. There we go. Kind of just attach it in there. So now you have a good space to kind of even out your pleats. You don't want a spot where there's like super, super tight and others that are really loose. You want them kind of evenly spread out. And you want it to be the same width as your section. So if you're doing a whole skirt gauging, um, you would take your bodice and divide it in quarters, since that's what you did with your skirt, and you would just put pins in your quarters, and you would attach up where your quarters are. So you'd put a pin here, put a pin in the quarter over here, and the center front, and then also on the other side and the center back again. That way you could just do a quarter at a time, and if a thread breaks, you only have to do a little bit. So how we're going to do this, I'm going to do this the um, official way which is to whip every pleat to the waistband. So I'm going to just start. There's a pleat right here, and I'm going to get it right where that um, on my piping. So there's that seam line with the piping, and that's where I'm going to put my needle. Tighten it. Pull the pleat right next to it. And kind of just keep going. Every three or four stitches, I would suggest doing a double stitch um, just for security. So I'll do a double stitch in this one to show you, which is just going over that same stitch again. And 
and we just keep going. And I prefer not to tie these off until I get all my stitches put in and then I'll tie it off because you never know when something's just not going to fit right and you're going to have to redo that section of gauging again because you really weren't paying attention and you thought something would fit and it decided it wasn't going to fit on you. And when we get it all uh, stitched in from the front you should see this. So there's our little piping. You can roll it up and still see the um, see your stitches, but the piping can cover the stitches. And you can see where our pleats start and where our um, gauging starts. And that is essentially how you gauge a skirt. It's really not that difficult. It's just um, the know-how and knowing that you can't replicate it by a machine. You have to do it by hand. But other than that, that is essentially the process. Before I let you go, I want to go into greater detail on how to get a lot of fabric into a very tiny waist. This is going to help you with those. This is going to help those of you with small waists who are doing periods where you have to put a lot of yardage into a very small waist circumference. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the end of our skirt. We're going to pretend this is a skirt. This is really just scrap because I don't have a very itty bitty waist anymore. And you are going to balance the skirt just like you normally do. So there's my balancing attempt. And we're going to take big bites on the bottom, tiny bite on top, big bite on bottom, tiny bite on top. And that's how you will do your gauging. Because it compresses a whole lot more fabric. So again, small bite on top, big bite on bottom. And you can see that's going to compress my fabric a whole lot more. And so that would be what my gauging would look like. If you are in a small, you can get away with more even stitching. But there might be a slight amount of trial and error to get it right. A quick and easy way to figure out how big your jump should be is to just measure an eighth of your waist circumference. So let's say you had a waist circumference of 24 inches. An eighth of that would be three inches. You would just take an eighth of your skirt width, so cut your, not cut, but use pins to mark your skirt into eighths, and then do an eighth of it and see if it measures three inches. And if it doesn't, figure out if you need, if you have like a four inch and that's as tight as you can pull it, it won't go, it won't compress anymore, then you clearly need to take bigger bites when you're gauging. If your plates are kind of more spread out than you need them to be, then you need to make smaller bites. This I find is easier when you're first starting out because an eighth of your skirt isn't that bad. Because you've only done an eighth of your skirt, you haven't wasted a whole lot of time, effort, or energy. And it's a whole lot easier to redo an eighth of a skirt than just to do the whole thing over again. And it's a lot less frustrating too. So just practice on something like that. You can even practice on scrap. Take the finished waist measurement of your bodice get an eighth or a fourth or something like that, something that's really small that you can work with and then practice on some scrap to get your gauging stitches even and nice before doing your whole skirt and getting frustrated when it doesn't fit. Once you get the hang of doing it, your fingers will automatically know how much of a bite to take for your measurements. Now this skirt is a reproduction 1850 skirt that is gauged to a self fabric waistband. Sometimes these waistbands are of scrap or lining fabric. This one just happens to be self fabric. Now for this particular dress, I wanted an offset closure, which is common during the 1850s and 60s. When I take this apart, you'll see that there is no gauging in the first few inches on this side of the waistband, but it gets covered with this gauging. And here's a reproduction 1850s Paisley cotton dress and its skirt is gauged directly to a self fabric waistband that is attached to the bodice. So instead of the waistband being separate and you baste the bodice in, this one is physically attached. It is piped on the bottom so it attaches basically the same way that we did the brown silk. Here's the finished dress with a partial waistband. So again it's just attached directly to the bodice except for the very front because I still wanted the center off because I still wanted that off-center closing, I just needed a partial waistband that just gets whipped to the bodice. 
but I find this to be less work, less fabric, and therefore less, less waistline bulk to add a partial waistband, but you do see both in original, so both is fine. Thank you so much for joining me today as we talked about gauging. I hope you learned something that you can put to good use and enjoy looking at some pretty original dresses. Have a fantastic weekend. I will see you back here on Monday.